This is Psychedelics and Mental Health Treatment, Shifts and Possibilities, an educational event hosted by NAMI NYC. This event is being live streamed to Facebook, will be um, live streamed to, to Facebook starting very shortly um, and recorded. So um, just please be aware of that. Um, para hispanohablantes, um, lo sentimos muchísimo. Eh, hemos nuestra intérprete um, se ha detenido. Um, vamos a tener interpretación um, en uh, lo más pronto posible. Así que por favor um, quede con nosotros si pueden. Um, pero uh, no tenemos interpretación en este momento. Um, vamos a lo vamos a tener lo más pro, lo más lo vamos a empezar lo más pronto posible. Um, y, y le agra agradecemos su paciencia. Uh, lo sentimos muchísimo. Um, I'm also going to put uh, just some information about um, ASL interpretation um, in here. Um, we do also have uh, automatic closed captions turned on. If you would like to view those, please click more at the bottom of your screen and click live transcript. Um, there we go. Um, thank you everyone uh, for being here and um, putting all of your, yeah, it's great to see folks from so many places coming, um, coming in. I wish I had time to shout everybody out. It's um, wonderful to, to see everybody, but uh, since we have been delayed, I wanna get started as quickly as we can. Um, we are live on Facebook, so uh, thank you everyone joining us from uh, joining us on Facebook and to everyone in the Zoom room. Um, again, my name is Clara. Um, this is Psychedelics and Mental Health Treatments, Shifts and Possibilities, um, and this is hosted by the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City, NAMI NYC. Um, okay. Um, we are gonna get started. Like I said, we're running a little behind, so I wanna um, move quickly. Um, I do wanna say just a few words about NAMI NYC um, before turning it over to our speaker. Um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City is uh, a grassroots mental health organization. Our mission is to provide support, education, and advocacy to all individuals and families impacted by mental illness. This means we have free virtual classes and support groups, both for people living with mental health issues and for anybody supporting someone living with a mental health issue. Our classes and groups are facilitated by volunteers who themselves are living with a mental health issue or supporting someone who is. So this is what we mean when we say peer led. Um, I could definitely say more, but again, wanna leave uh, plenty of time for our speaker. Um, if you would like to know more, please go to our website, namiNYC.org or call our helpline at 212-684-3264. Um, and that inform we're going to put that information in the chat um, very shortly as well. Um, I do see a, a couple of questions um, about uh, recording and so forth. Um, the event is being recorded uh, as well as live streamed. Uh, hi to those joining us from Facebook. Um, and uh, all participants will receive a link to the recording afterwards if you would like to share it or um, review it uh, as well as um, the slides. Um, okay, so for this conversation, we are really honored to welcome uh, Jessica Kadosh. Uh, she is a medical anthropologist working and uh, working at Maya PBC as a research manager and is highly involved in Colorado statewide psychedelic policy as the former executive director of the Montreal Psychedelic Society. Jessica is passionate about bridging the non-for-profit and for-profit world of psychedelic initiatives. So we are really grateful that you are sharing your expertise with us. Um, and really quickly, one more technical thing. Um, if anyone would like to turn off the subtitles, again, you just go to more, the three dots at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you should have the option to either show or hide subtitles. Um, so feel free to do that. Okay, uh, we are gonna be saving questions until the end, but I will be moderating the chat and um, uh, will answer any questions that I can there. Um, okay, so I'll pass it over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Clara. I'm so glad to be here and really honored that um, 
you have chosen me to give this in-depth introduction on psychedelics for the treatment of mental health. Um, as uh, Clara mentioned, um, I'm a medical and cultural anthropologist. Um, and I've been uh, studying uh, the Western biomedical world's interaction with uh, psychedelics um, for the past six years. Um, and so my specialties really lie in how are we going to be bringing psychedelics into the realm of biomedicine and really what, what how does it work and what is happening when we start telling the public um, that psychedelics are no longer being called a drug um, that is illegal, but is now being used as a medicine um, to help treat various mental illnesses. Um, so today uh, we're going to be going over, um, you know, what are psychedelics um, for people who don't know, um, the history of psychedelics, um, and so really focusing on indigenous uh, traditions um, for a little bit, um, and then the research that has happened prior to um, you know, our current modern day research and clinical trials that are happening. Um, so that, that most of that happened between the 1950s and the 1970s. Um, and then the Controlled Substances Act and what really led to that. Um, then I'll move on to uh, modern day psychedelic research and um, what's happening with the clinical trials, um, as well as what a standard protocol really looks like with psychedelic assisted therapy today. Um, and then I'm gonna go into psychedelic legislation and to really just explain to everybody where this is legal, where you can find it, um, and um, if it's something that you can access in your home uh, town. Um, I noticed that there's quite a few people from Europe here, and I most of this presentation is pretty uh, American-centered, uh, and I apologize for that. Being a Canadian, I've, I've always taken a look at those things, um, and I, I focused most of the what's happening with the clinical trials in, in the United States, so my apologies for that. Um, the first thing I would just like to mention here is a caution uh, for everybody um, and kind of a caveat to everything I'm about to present. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, people out there who are suffering with various mental illnesses who have been suffering for years and years and years and decades and have um, not been able to find any treatment that really works for them. And as a result, um, many people end up looking towards psychedelic assisted therapy as a magic bullet and a cure all and all of all of our pains. Um, and it's really important that before I talk about any, all the successes that are happening with psychedelic assisted therapy for the treatment of mental illnesses, um, that we, that we just keep in mind, you know, and, and assess our expectations, you know, that this true success of psychedelic assisted therapy lies in the set, which is the mindset um, that you are coming into um, the psychedelic experience, um, as well as the setting. So that's the environment and where you are, who you're with, um, as well as the a commitment to long-term integration work. And so I'll be going over the, what integration really means when I look at the protocol, but it just, it's very important that I just state here that, you know, psychedelics are not a panacea and they're not going to cure everything. And it's not just the drug that helps. It's a really this long-term work associated with the therapy um, that's going to lead to a successful outcome um, for people who are suffering with various mental illnesses. So that's just important for me to say because there's a lot of hype and excitement around psychedelics right now. And I just wanted to to reduce that a little bit, but nonetheless, it's, it all is very exciting. Um, so what are psychedelics? Um, I'll be going over a list of the psychedelics in the next slide, but just briefly, um, the term psychedelic was coined by Humphrey Osmond, um, who was a Canadian researcher uh, who studied psychedelics, who studied uh, LSD for the treatment of alcoholism in the 1950s. Um, and the term was meant to mean mind manifesting. So it's a very uh, all encompassing term and the term psychedelic can, um, be used to refer to many types of situations. You can have a psychedelic experience that's induced by some kind of mystical experience with God, for instance, or, um, or a dream can be very psychedelic. Um, so anything that's very like mind manifesting, um, and you'll see in the next definition, it's, it's a class of hallucinogenic drugs, 
whose primary effect is to trigger a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And um, you can also achieve a non-ordinary state of consciousness through breath work and meditation and yoga. Um, and so psychedelic and mind manifesting could, could be very uh, vast words. Um, but when we're talking about a psychedelic drug, um, there are specific compounds that I will be listing in the next slide. Um, these drugs tend to uh, cause uh, specific psychological, visual, and auditory changes. Um, and they are currently listed as Schedule One substances, meaning they are illegal and currently inaccessible mostly to the public. And as I go over the list of psychedelics, I'll, I'll be um, telling you which ones are accessible to the public and which ones are not. Um, and finally, you know, the way just kind of briefly, and we'll go over this more deeply, um, the way psychedelics really work in terms of treating mental illness is that they help to change your relationship to the suffering um, that one is experiencing, and they allow one to stand in, in a different relationship to what that suffering is and how they want to be interacting with it. And I'll, I'll be going more in depth about that. Do you, uh, Clara? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Para hispanohablantes, uh, ya tenemos disponible la interpretación. Um, uh, hay que uh, hacer clic en el globo de la parte inferior, del, inferior de la pantalla y selecciona español um, para oír la interpretación en vivo en, uh, en vivo en español. Si necesitan ayuda, pueden pedir en el chat. Um, y también es necesario o es, es uh, útil a tocar donde dice silenciar audio on, original para solo escuchar el, el intérprete. Um, ok, uh, y las instrucciones están en el chat también. Ok, thank you, Jessica. Thank you. So the interpreter is here now. Great, amazing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the general overview of what psychedelics are. Um, and then over here, we have a long list of all the psychedelics. Um, it's a lot of words, but we'll go through it slowly. Uh, we've got lots of time. Um, so there, these are the types of psychedelics that you'll typically be hearing about when it comes to clinical trials. Um, first, we have psilocybin containing mushrooms, um, which are commonly known as magic mushrooms or shrooms. Um, they are a type of fungi uh, that contain psilocybin, um, which turns into psilocin upon ingestion. Um, typically, you'll experience some uh, visual and psychological effects uh, when, induced, when taking psilocybin, and the effects can last anywhere between uh, four to eight hours, I would say. Um, Next, we have LSD, which is a uh, lysergic acid, um, also known as just acid. Um, and uh, it typically includes intensified thoughts, emotions, and sensory perception. Um, the length of this psychedelic drug uh, could be anywhere between eight to 12 hours, potentially even longer. Um, then we have DMT, which is um, can be found in ayahuasca, which you have, which, which we describe here at the end. Um, but is the compound uh, dimethyltryptamine. Um, and DMT is present in the leaves of the plant, um, uh, Psychotria uh, viridis, and is responsible for the hallucinations um, ayahuasca users will experience. There are also synthetic versions of DMT um, that can be smoked um, and inhaled. Um, and the effects of DMT vary depending on how uh, they are, it is administered. Um, then you'll, uh, and uh, sorry, these three that I just listed are currently all uh, schedule one substances and are currently not legal um, in the United States. Um, they are legal in other countries. Um, I don't have that information here, um, but uh, that, that information is easy to find. Once you have this list, you can conduct your research and find out in what countries they are legal in. Ketamine is one of the only um, psychedelic uh, compounds that are legal in the United States um, and as well as Canada. Um, ketamine is a medication that's primarily used for uh, induction and the maintenance of anesthesia. Um, it induces dissociative anesthesia and a trance-like state providing pain relief, sedation, and amnesia. 
Um, so currently, there are such things as ketamine-assisted therapy clinics um, that you can find in the U.S. Um, there is there are also ketamine infusion clinics, which don't always offer. Um, the assisted therapy component. And if you're looking for psychedelic assisted therapy um, and you're looking towards ketamine, um, you can find ass assisted therapy clinics that have that additional component rather than just an infusion clinic that would just give you the substance and then you go home. Um, and again, I'll be going over all of uh, how, which uh, substances are being used to treat what illnesses a little bit after. Um, and then we have MDMA, which is often called, referred to as ecstasy or MALI. Um, this triggers the release of three key neurotransmitters, um, serotonin, dopamine, and uh, norepinephrine. Um, the most significant effect of MDMA is the release of serotonin in large quantities, um, which actually drains the brain's supply of serotonin, um, which can mean uh, days of depression after its use. So what occurs is um, there's a, a spike in your serotonin levels when you take MDMA. And what will happen is often a dip in uh, your serotonin levels after, which would lead to depression-like feelings. Um, and it's just important that you give yourself the time um, if you are experimenting with MDMA to reach that homeo, that like um, that middle ground for your serotonin to come back to uh, its regular state. Um, and then we have salvia divinorum, um, which is a plant species with uh, transient psychoactive properties um, when its leaves are consumed by either chewing, smoking, or a uh, drink as a tea. Um, the leaves contain opioid-like compounds that induce hallucinations. Um, there are places that you can retrieve salvia currently. I don't believe it is a schedule one substance. Um, and uh, the effects of that last um, I think somewhere between 20 to 45 minutes. Um, oh, and I forgot the MDMA um, will last anywhere between um, four to seven hours. Um, and ketamine is a short acting um, a, a psychedelic um, at somewhere between 30 to 90 minutes. Um, then we have mescaline, which is uh, the derivative of San Pedro or peyote, um, which are both cacti. Um, so they are naturally occurring psychedelic um, that um, are often comparable to LSD or psilocybin. Um, they are not as long acting as, as LSD, um, but um, the time frame escapes me at the current moment. Um, iboga and ibogaine um, is another uh, plant that induces psychedelic effects. Um, so it's a naturally occurring psychoactive substance found in plants. Um, I can't pronounce these <laughs> terms, um, so I will skip over them. Um, and it is typically uh, used in, um, in Gabon. Um, Africa um, with the Buiti culture. So uh, they have a long history of indigenous use and uh, preliminary research indicates that it may help counter um, uh, opiate addiction um, and withdrawal symptoms. Um, and then we have ayahuasca, which is an ancient plant-based tea derived from a combination of multiple plants. Um, and that, that, could, that is typically used in places like Brazil and Peru uh, sometimes in Ecuador and Colombia as well. Um, yeah, so those are all of the many psychedelics that are out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I will move on to how psychedelics work in the brain um, and how they really affect uh, mental illnesses. Um, so over here we have, I, I took a video from somebody named Michael Pollan, um, who wrote a book called How to Change Your Mind. It came out in 2019. Um, and he wrote a very extensive overview of psychedelics and how they have been used traditionally and also how they can be used to treat mental illness. And I found his video over here very helpful to explain um, how psychedelics really help to treat mental illness. So um, let me know if you can hear this. Yes. So how do these psychedelics work? Well, the honest answer is we don't entirely. Just confirming, Clara, you can hear this? Okay, great. We know, but we know a few things. 
One is they fit a certain receptor site, the serotonin 5-2A receptor. Um, and they look a lot like serotonin if you look at the molecular uh, models of them. And in fact, LSD fits that receptor site even better than serotonin does, and it stays there longer. And that's why the LSD trip lasts, can last 12 hours. What happens after that, we don't really know. It's an agonist to that receptor, so it increases its activity. Um, and this, you know, the neuroscientists say, lead to a cascade of effects, which is shorthand for don't really know what happens next. Um, but one thing we do know, or we think we know, is that uh, it appears that one particular brain network is deactivated or, or quieted, and that is the default mode network. This was discovered uh, not very long ago by a researcher in England named Robin Carhart Harris, who was dosing people with psilocybin and LSD and then sliding them into an MRI machine uh, to take an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance image. And um, the expectation, I think, was that people would see an excitation of many, many different networks in the brain. Uh, you know, that's what the kind of mental fireworks sort of, you know, foretold. But he was very surprised to discover that one particular network was downregulated, and that was this default mode network. So what is that? Well, it's a, it's a, a tightly linked set of structures uh, connecting the prefrontal cortex to the posterior cingulate cortex to, the, to deeper, older centers of emotion and memory. Um, it appears to be involved in things like self-reflection theory of mind, the ability to impute mental states to others, mental time travel, the ability to, to project forward in time and back, which is central to creating an identity, right? You don't have an identity without a memory. Um, and uh, the so-called autobiographical memory, um, the, the, the function by which we construct the story of who we are by taking the things that happen to us and, and folding them into that narrative. And that appears to take place in the posterior cingulate cortex. Um, so, you know, to the extent the ego can be said to have a location in the brain, it appears to be this, uh, the default mode network. It's, it's active when you're doing nothing, when your mind is wandering. Um, it can be very self-critical. It's, it's where self-talk takes place. Um, and that goes quiet. And when that goes quiet, the brain is sort of, as one of the neuroscientists put it, put it, let off the leash, because that those ego functions, that fun, that, that self idea is a regulator of all mental activity. And kind of a, you know, the brain is a hierarchical system and the default mode network appears to be at the top. It's kind of the orchestra conductor or corporate executive. And you take that out of the picture and suddenly you have this uprising uh, from other parts of the brain and you have networks that don't ordinarily communicate with one another suddenly striking up conversations. So you might have the visual cortex talking to the uh, auditory cortex, the auditory system, and suddenly you're seeing music, um, or it becomes palpable. You you can feel it or smell it. You know synesthesia. So you have this temporary rewiring in the brain in the absence of the control of the the regulator, and this appears to have uh, you know a beneficial effect in terms of jogging the brain out of bad patterns. Um, Many of the, the disorders that psychedelics appears to treat well are um, manifestations of a stuck brain, a brain that is locked in uh, loops, uh, a mind that's telling itself destructive stories like, uh, I can't get through the day without a cigarette. I can't, uh, I'm unworthy of love. Uh, my work is shit, you know. Um, these kind of uh, evidence of, of habitual thinking in a, in a really negative loop um, are relieved. Um, and it may be that an overactive ego is, is what punishes us. Um, and that relief from that dictator is exactly what some people need to free themselves from habits, mental habits and behavioral habits. That at least is the theory. Um, I think there's a lot more we need to learn, um, but it's a very provocative theory. And then if we have a tool for behavior change, that's a huge deal. I mean, I know having worked on food for many years that changing people's food habits as adults is almost impossible. We are creatures of habit in many, many ways. And the older we get, the worse it gets. And so that if we have something that can kind of lubricate cognition, that can uh, shake the snow globe, as, as another researcher put it, 
um, this might be very helpful in um, helping people escape these traps. Right, so that is a very kind of clear way of explaining a lot of the research that is being done in neuroscientific um, clinical trials or psychiatric clinical trials. And what I really like about Michael Pollan is that he's really good at uh, explaining it in a way that the average person can understand because he's spoken with a lot of these researchers and he has um, really done a good job at, at doing his own research in reading all of the, 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 re the clinical trials that are, are currently um, happening. So I really think that that's a good way to explain um, how um, psychedelics work in the brain. Now I'm going to move on to the history of psychedelics and I'm just gonna do a time check. Um, great, 20 minutes. So um, psychedelics have actually been found to, um, to be used in cultures around the world for the past 5,000, uh, uh, since, since 5,000 BCE, so uh, almost 7,000 years ago. Um, and in the photos that you find that I've put over here, um, you can just see, you know, this one is a, is a fresco of um, a mushroom uh, holding shaman, um, which was found in southeastern Algeria in 5000 BCE. Um, in the second photo, these are the Indian Rig Vedas, which describe the use of a psychedelic drink called Soma. Uh, we are still unsure exactly what um, uh, what drink what what psychedelics were composed in um, in the the drink called Soma. Um, but there's a, been some research on it and I'm not an expert in that field. Um, but uh, the third photo is uh, the archeological mushroom stones, which indicate that a sophisticated uh, mushroom cult existed in Guatemala. And we now know that, um, that many um, Aztec uh, cultures uh, used psilocybin containing mushrooms in many of their rituals um, and their day-to-day -day life. Um, and then in the fourth photo um, is a uh, Chavin um, stone carving from a temple in Northern Peru, um, which shows the principal deity holding a San Pedro cactus, which you can see right over here, uh, which I indicated before has, um, has um, mescaline containing properties. Um, it's important when we're, we are uh, studying and, and talking about the introduction of psychedelics uh, into the biomedical world that we pay reverence and honor to the, where the, these psychedelic compounds came from and, um, and how they had been used previously to the biomedical adoption of them. Um, this is how we can at least try to stay away from some type of appropriation of uh, deep rooted cultural traditions. Um, and so it, it's really important that we do pay attention to the history um, of indigenous traditions with psychedelics and you know, the people who held these medicines as, and were stewards to the medicines before uh, Western biomedicine came and uh, learned that psychedelics can uh, help treat uh, various conditions. Um, and when I did an interview with another cultural anthropologist named Dr. Evgenia Futu, um, she explained she she is a an expert and has been studying various uh, indigenous cultures around. Um, um, I believe it's Peru, uh, which was her uh, main focus. Um, and so when I spoke with her, kind of trying to understand where, what, how psychedelics had been traditionally used prior to the Western um, adoption of them, she explained to me that ayahuasca in, in particular um, was used in rituals that were culture affirming, um, enforcing certain cultural norms and ideas. She said it was used in communal rituals where men would, and possibly women, um, would take it and they would recite myths and stories. This is what I mean by culture affirming, she says. They were passing down knowledge, oral knowledge, and reinforcing certain cultural ideals. Um, overall, it was used for the communal good. Um, and so, you know, right now, the way that we're talking about psychedelics is uh, how can we use psychedelics to treat 
various conditions and diagnoses in, from the DSM-5. But when we really look at how psychedelics have been used in uh, traditional indigenous cultures, they were used for all kinds of reasons and not only to treat uh, an ailment or to treat some kind of harm, but also just to bring community together and to bring culture together. Um, so moving on, you know, because there's so much that could be addressed in the history of psychedelic assisted therapy, um, uh, psychedelics uh, had been researched in, from the 1950s to the 1970s. Um, and uh, over here you see Timothy Leary um, and Richard Alpert, who uh, Richard Alpert became known later as Ram Das, um, who is a uh, Eastern spiritual teacher, um, who was an Eastern spiritual teacher um, and taught a lot about um, yoga and other spiritual concepts. Um, he wrote a book called Be Here Now. Um, but before that, he was a psychiatrist working at Harvard along with Tim Timothy Leary. Um, and over here, we have just a list of the various studies that were um, taking place in the early, in the 1950s and 1970s. Um, so in 1938 is when LSD was synthesized. Um, by Dr. Albert Hoffman um, with the intention of obtaining actually a circulatory and respiratory stimulant. So he was looking for uh, to synthesize a compound that would help with uh, respiratory issues and he founded LSD um, and uh, definitely had some different uh, effects than he was anticipating. Um, and then in 1952, um, they were doing studies with LSD for the treatment of alcoholism. Um, that was with uh, Humphrey Osman and Abram Hoffer. Um, in these early studies, they reported 40 to 45% abstinence rates from the people that they were treating. And then in 1961, they did the Concord prison, exper prison experiment with Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert at Harvard University. And this is when they went into prisons and they gave them psilocybin containing mushrooms to see if there would be an effect on their ability to reintegrate into society and really reflect on what they had done that sent them to prison in the first place. Um, I don't have uh, the, the, uh, success, the um, uh, outcomes of all of this research here, but this is really just an overview of all the research that had been happening. Um, in 1961, they were also researching LSD to enhance human personality and creativity in healthy people, people who, um, who don't have any diagnoses. Um, and then in 1962, they did the Good Friday experiment, which was to uh, discover whether psilocybin can incite mystical experiences in religiously predisposed subjects. Um, and this is when the mystical experiences questionnaire was created. Um, and so this was when they're trying to quantify a mystical experience through a questionnaire um, and, and through just studies and trying to compare it to mystical experiences that um, other religious, that religious ex people had exper experienced beforehand. Um, then in 1962, Howard Lotzoff um, conducted experiments on Ibogaine's use in the treatment of cocaine and heroin addiction. And in 1966, um, I think that's supposed to be meant to 67, a Czechoslovakian study reported good results with LSD treatment for personality disorders. All of the studies in the 1950s to the 1970s were very great preliminary work, um, but they lacked a lot of consistency in the clinical trials that we see today and that we are working through today. Um, and so I wouldn't really, I don't wanna put too much of an emphasis on um, you know, the success of these, of this early on research. I think this was really just setting the stage um, for what we have today, but it's cool to know that between the years of 1950 and 1965, some 40,000 patients had been prescribed one form of LSD therapy or another as treatment for neurosis, um, schizophrenia, and psychopathy. Um, so, and then came uh, the Controlled Substances Act in 1972. 
Um, so this was um, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970. And it is the federal US drug policy under which the manufacture, importation, possession, use and distribution of certain narcotics, stimulants, depressants, hallucinogens, anabolic steroids and other chemicals is regulated. Um, so this halted with the introduction of the Controlled Substances Act, which put most of the psychedelics into the Schedule One category, which we will look at in just a moment. Um, this halted all psychedelic research studies and all, all of the studies and psychedelic research went underground. Um, and by underground means either people were conducting their own research outside of labs or um, other people such as Stan Groff started conducting research on holotropic breathwork um, to see ways in which breathwork can induce these altered states of consciousness as well um, when he could no longer um, use uh, study LSD. So over here we have um, the table which uh, looks at um, the the different schedules for uh for different substances and so in schedule one you have substances like mdma heroin lsd marijuana um, meth and peyote there are other ones in here as well this was this is not an extensive list but in category one the substances are said to have a high potential for abuse and have no currently accepted medical use in treatment in the US and have a lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision. And so 1972, um, uh, the, the Nixon um, uh, um, government uh, put these substances in this category claiming that they didn't have any medical use. Um, and so now we're finding ourselves in a uh, what is being called a renaissance where people are once again being able to study psychedelics um, and to really demonstrate um, that uh, psychedelics do have accepted safe that, that can be accepted for safety uh, and safe use under medical supervision. Um, so in 1986, um, MAPS was founded, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, and it was to research the benefits of MDMA assisted therapy. In 2017, um, the FDA granted MDMA as a break, uh, they granted MDMA breakthrough status for the treatment of treatment resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. And so currently MAPS is a conduct is in their phase three of clinical trials um, for uh, the study of MDMA for the treatment of PTSD. Um, and in 2006, the Johns Hopkins um, University uh, School of Medicine launched the first rigorous double blind placebo controlled clinical study to examine the effects of psilocybin. Um, an overwhelming number of participants in the Johns Hopkins study rated their journeys with psilocybin as either the most meaningful experience of their lives or within the top five, comparable to the birth of a first child or the death of a parent. Um, and so I would, these are kind of the two organizations that have, and uh, along with Imperial College London, actually, um, the three organizations that have really kick-started um, psychedelic assisted therapy for the treatment of uh, mental illnesses. Um, and then here are a series of other studies that are happening currently um, through various initiatives um, and, and universities. So we have um, LSD on neuroplasticity and healthy subjects, um, psilocybin for end-of-life distress, ibogaine for opioid addiction, psilocybin for smoking cessation, psilocybin, um, and for anorexia nervosa, um, an online study of naturalistic psilocybin use, uh, psilocybin for depression, and anyways, uh, all of these are here, um, and you can all take a look at them. Um, at the end of the slide, there are a series of uh, links that you can click, and um, you can go on to clinicaltrial.gov uh, to see what clinical trials are currently happening with psychedelics. Um, specifically, you know, I would search up for MDMA, psilocybin, or uh, ibogaine, um, or LSD, and see if uh, any of those kind of apply to you, and you could find those there. And then you can also read through there what the uh, success rates are looking like. Um, one thing to note, um, you know, which is really difficult in the 
um, rewriting of the of our nar of our narrative with psychedelics is there's a lot of fear around the effects of psychedelics and um, how much these substances can uh, impact people's lives. And so um, in this study that was um, um, done by Dr. David Nutt, um, they researched the normalized ratings of harm potential of psilocybin relative to other drugs as rated by experts in the United Kingdom um, using on a multidimensional scale. So drugs are ranked by overall harm from left, most harmful to right, least harmful, with harm to users, blue, and harm to others, red, shown separately. And so you'll see here uh, substances like mushrooms and LSD and ecstasy, which is MDMA, um, really rank so very low on in terms of harm to users, as well as harm to others. Um, in fact, with LSD and mushrooms, I mean, I don't see anything um, for harm to others, which is the red component. And then when you look at substances like alcohol, you know, they just skyrocket in terms of harm to users and harm to others. And so I think that's just a valuable um, thing to demonstrate in terms of looking at uh, how these substances have an effect on the individual and the world around them. Um, over here, we have a typical MDMA protocol. Um, and so this is what it looks like when uh, doing um, psychedelic assisted therapy, uh, specifically with the MAPS MDMA trial. And so what happens is there's a screening process where um, they will screen you for any um, uh, specifically for, for bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Um, currently, there's very little research that's being done um, for bipolar disorder or schizophrenia um, with the use of psychedelics. And so because of that, it's very hard for, uh, for people to, um, to say whether or not um, psychedelics are safe for people who suffer from uh, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So in the screening process, they would determine whether or not you qualify for the study. Um, and then over here, you have three preparatory sessions. Um, each preparatory session is, a, is around 90 minutes. And so there's a lot of preparation that needs to come before any psychedelic is given. Um, and so this is where you'll set intentions, you'll set goals, and you'll establish a relationship with your therapist. Um, then there's the experimental session. And with MDMA, um, they allow it to last um, eight hours. Um, after the experimental session, there's three integration sessions. And in the integration sessions, this is what I was talking about before, you know, it's, it's not just about the substance that you're taking, which is going to give it, you your golden ticket kind of, oh, I'm healed now and I'm fixed. Um, but it's much more of um, the long-term work that happens in these integration sessions. And hopefully they continue uh, moving on. This is a clinical trial, so it's a short-term experience. Um, but then you get another experimental session and then more integration sessions. And again, each of these sessions are 90 minutes and these ones are eight hours. Um, and then there's the outcome measure at the six month follow-up, which is the unblinding. Um, and um, yes, I see, I just saw a comment saying that I should slow down a little bit for Spanish interpreters. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so uh, at the six month follow-up, there's the unblinding um, where um, the uh, therapist and the patient discover whether or not they have been given um, uh, the MDMA. And if they have not been given the MDMA, um, then they, uh, they go back into the beginning and do the experimental session again, uh, because in this clinical trial, they want to make sure that um, uh, everybody does end up getting access to the medicine that they are testing. Um, and finally, um, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying my hardest to give a large overview of all the components, you know, from research to, um, to legislation, um, but this is kind of like a timeline of where we're at with psychedelic legislation. Um, uh, the first city to uh, decriminalize psilocybin was Denver, which is where I live. 
Um, and uh, that was in May of 2019. And then Oakland uh, followed suit very quickly. And then Santa Cruz, California followed suit. And um, here I noticed, uh, I will note that um, Oakland decriminalized all entheogenic plants. Um, and so uh, that includes um, mushrooms, uh, ibogaine, um, DMT, and um, and mescaline, um, not including peyote. Um, and then in Santa Cruz, um, they only did psilocybin. Ann Arbor did all entheogen, uh, naturally occurring entheogens. And then in November 2020, um, Oregon legalized psilocybin assisted therapy um, and also uh, decriminalized all drugs. And so that is gonna be going into effect in January of 2023. Um, healing centers will begin to open um, in Oregon in uh, January of 2023, where you'll be able to receive psilocybin assisted therapy, whether or not you have any certain so sort of condition um, or diagnosis. Um, and they've also decriminalized all drugs, which means that um, uh, it's become the lowest level of, uh, you know, of priority for any, um, any law officers. Um, and then there's a series of other uh, cities that have followed suit um, that include, um, you know, DC decriminalizing a few psychedelics in November of 2020, um, areas in Michigan, Massachusetts, decriminalized psilocybin and ibogaine and so on and so forth. And we're seeing, what we're seeing here is a huge resurgence in uh, our our relation or a change in our relationship with psychedelic substances when it went underground in the 1970s and there was a lot of fear around what these substances are and can do and now we're finding that in the U.S. Um, there's a lot of people who want to to see an opportunity for people to heal with psychedelics again um, and once you decriminalize and or uh, legalized, then that, that offers a lot more opportunity for research to come through. Um, so I wanted to give uh, a good amount of time for uh, questions, um, but I did want to just go over a list of these resources that I've included here. Um, I, I was uh, only able to cover so much in the 45 minutes that I was given, and I wanted to make sure that I gave a very healthy overview from the indigenous traditions all the way to legislation. Um, but over here is psychedelicsupport.org, which where you could find integration therapists. So if you or anybody you know has taken any psychedelics and is having trouble making sense of that experience, um, you can go to psychedelic.support.org and, um, or it's just psychedelic.support actually. And you could find therapists who specialize in this type of therapy um, and can help you really make sense of that experience. Um, Fireside Project is a psychedelic hotline. Um, it's 24 seven and you can call at any time of the day um, if you're in psychedelic distress and you need to speak with somebody and you don't know what to do. Um, sometimes calling 911 isn't the, the most helpful thing because that can cause a lot of anxiety and stress when somebody's in a psychedelic experience. And so calling the hotline sometimes is just helpful to call um, are these resources for U.S. residents only? I don't believe so. I'm sure you can uh, call a Fireside Project at any point, psychedelic.support. I believe they have um, therapists all over the world, um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Thank you for that question. Um, but, you know, of course, if there is a medical emergency, please do call 911. Um, but psychedelic... Uh, uh, the, the hotline, the Fireside Project is a good place to call just for consultation if somebody's just going through an emotionally difficult time. Um, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies is the, organ is the public benefit corporation um, and non-for-profit that is doing the MDMA studies for PTSD. Um, the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, I'm sorry I didn't write the things on the side here, but that is uh, the Johns Hopkins University. Um, uh, uh, center where they're doing psychedelic research. Um, this is a cool article from the New York Times on the promises and perils of psychedelic healthcare, um, the brief his a brief history of psychedelic psych 
psychiatry. Um, this is a good, uh, interesting history research, a uh, research done by a historian named Erica Dick, um, which looks at the history of LSD treatment for alcoholism. Um, the abuse potential for medical psilocybin according to the eight factors of the Controlled Substances Act. Um, this is a link to the clinicaltrials.gov, um, which would give you a kind of a knowledge of all the clinical trials that are happening. Um, How to Change Your Mind is the book by Michael Pollan. Um, Michael Pollan is the person who I wrote, who I put the... Um, the video of explaining how psychedelics work in the mind. Um, and then a couple of other cool um, articles that I uh, found were super helpful for me. Um, but you know, there's so much to learn with psychedelics um, and how they could be used for the treatment of various conditions. Uh, and um, that is everything that I'll be presenting on today. And I'm so grateful to be here and to be presenting. I'm a medical anthropologist. I am not a psychiatrist. I am not a neuroscientist. All I'm doing is studying humans' relationship with these substances and how this is changing over time and how um, our culture is changing our relationship with these substances. So I apologize if I missed any important information and I'd love to open it up for uh, questions at this point. And I will also humbly admit that I am not uh, an expert in all of the research that is coming through at the moment. Um, and I really encourage people to, to do their research and, and do some reading. Thank you. And thank you again to Nami for, for bringing me here today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for um, addressing uh, so many topics. Um, we, we really appreciate it. I know there have been a bunch of questions. Um, I do wanna go through some of the questions that were listed in the chat. Um, and then I do see um, some folks have their have their hands raised. Um, so hopefully we will have time. Uh, well, we will probably not have time to get to all of the questions. Um, so I just want to let everybody know, unfortunately, that we have a limited amount of time. So we may not get to all questions, but we will do our best. Um, so the first, I really wanted to um, address um, a point that a few people kind of brought up. Um, which was sort of about the risks associated with psychedelics and particularly um, some folks shared uh, experiences of loved ones um, who had uh, taken um, a psychedelic and uh, subsequently had episode, like very immediately afterwards had episode, uh, their first episode of psychosis and um, had that continue on uh, in an, in an ongoing way after afterwards. Um, so can you speak a little bit about, um, about those risks, about um, what, yeah, uh, speak, speak a little bit about that. Mm -hmm, absolutely, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I tried to allude to it a little bit uh, during the talk, um, but there has not been enough research done on how psychedelics have an impact on people who have predispositions to various uh, psychiatric um, or, or um, specifically, you know, personality disorders such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And so for those reasons, it is really important that um, you are consulting with some kind of healthcare professional prior to in engaging with any of these substances because there are situations where it can trigger um, some kind of predisposition that may have not been there before. And so this is why in the screening processes within clinical trials, you will not be qualified um, to partake in the clinical trial if you have any family history of psychosis or bipolar um, or schizophrenia. And so I think that these are the reasons why as much as I believe that decriminalization is really valuable because I believe that humans should be able to choose what we do with our bodies and these substances, they come from the earth and they shouldn't be uh, illegal and people shouldn't go to prison for them. I also really believe in the regulation of them and, and bringing them to the clinical space so that people who may have a predisposition um, to any of these uh, disorders are in a space that have a proper set and a setting and have the proper um, 
uh, protocols in place to deal with a situation like that or to avoid that from happening at all through proper screening measures. Absolutely. Um, going off of that, there's a couple of sort of related questions. Um, uh, is there any, do you know of any research on individuals with multiple diagnosis, either with or without um, a prior risk of, of psychosis? Currently, I'm not familiar with any of the, the that research. It, it's possible that it's happening. It's really hard to keep track of all the research that's going on right now. If you just go on clinicaltrial.gov, there's literally thousands of research studies that are happening right now. Uh, but I'm not familiar with any studies that are looking at people who have multiple diagnoses. Um, I think the reason for this is because we're still in a stage uh, in the psychedelic uh, research movement um, where we want to be really particular about what it is that we're studying and what it is that this certain compound is addressing. And so currently the research is being ve is very specialized and is focusing on individual components such as end of life anxiety, um, treatment resistant, uh, PTSD or depression um, and addiction um, and the other ones that I had listed um, over there. Perfect. Um, cool. A um, couple, couple questions, um, but they all kind of boil down to, um, do we know anything about what do we know about the long-term effects, either positive um, in terms of the how long a, a positive effect could last with psychedelic assisted treatment or potential uh, long-term negative effects? Hmm. Thank you for that question. That's a, it's a very important question. And I think this is where um, I have to put my hat and keep my hat on as a social scientist and that my true expertise is really in the relationship that humans are having with this substance and how we're bringing it into our culture. I can say from my own personal experience, and, and that's all I can say, is that um, the long-term positive effects can can last in a way, you know, similar to what Michael Pollan was saying is um, is really about framing the way that you are perceiving the world around you, and typically that has really helped me with a sense of presence and a sense of um, impermanence around of the world around me, and that could be helpful for some people, and it could be anxiety provoking for others. Um, I think one thing that I, I didn't get to mention is that Dr. Stan Groff, who did a lot of research on LSD and breath work, um, calls psychedelics a non-specific amplifier, and so um, whatever it, it's very possible, you know, that if you have um, personality type such as uh, narcissism or, um, you know, sociopathy, um, uh, that those could just be enhanced by psychedelics, especially if you don't have the proper set and setting and container to integrate these substances. Um, and so I would say that the long-term effects are more on like a personality um, change and the way that you're perceiving the world relating to the world. There are a lot of very interesting validated measures and scales um, that are looking at long-term effects such as um, the nature relatedness scale. And so we found, we, the researchers um, have found that upon taking a psychedelic, um, people's relatedness with, with nature increases over time. Um, challenging experiences questionnaire, perceived emotional synchrony. Um, there's a ton of really amazing questionnaires that have been demonstrating these long-term positive effects. Um, and currently I'm not really familiar with a lot of the long-term negative effects unless in the event of somebody who does suffer with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or other personality disorders like that, which um, there's also, um, uh, uh, long-term, um, oh, like, the, sorry, there was, there was a correction that bipolar and, uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are not considered personality disorders. Um, just to clarify that for the, for the audience, uh, oh. bipolar disorder would be considered a mood disorder and schizophrenia would be, um, considered a thought disorder. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Correction. Thanks for that. Yeah. And again, and thank you, know. you to the audience member who um, brought that to my attention. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I always welcome corrections. I'm uh, again, yeah, I'm not a scientist or, or psychiatrist and 
Um, so I'm not extremely familiar with the, the, the way that the DSM categorizes these conditions, um, but uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, there was another question, um, just going back to your point about the container and the way that um, these, these substances can be used within um, the context of therapy. Um, uh, has there been any studies or do you know anything about um, the use of psychedelics with um, various creative arts therapies, such as mm -hmm. music, dance, art therapies? Mm -hmm. That was a question that was brought up. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I did just want to mention one other um, potential uh, negative long-term outcome. Um, I couldn't remember what it stood for. Is called hallucinogen uh, persisting perception disorder, which is uh, the long-term potential of hallucinations coming uh, through. Um, there, they are currently doing research on this, and I don't know what the what they are learning about it. Um, in my six years of conducting this research, I haven't heard of many situations where this does come up. So I'm not sure how frequently this occurs, but HPPD is a potential that could uh, occur from uh, psychedelic experimentation and use. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there. It's really important. Um, I just couldn't remember what it's, it's the HPPD stood for. Um, the question on art therapy, um, yes, there is a lot of relationship specifically right now with ketamine and art therapy right now. Um, just all kinds of different types of um, um, media that you can use for art therapy. Music therapy is absolutely a strong component of psychedelic assisted therapy uh, in every I mean, mo I, I would say the majority of clinical trials that are happening right now, um, there's always music that's happening. Um, and so sometimes that could be um, live music, like um, some, some drumming in an ayahuasca ceremony, for instance, um, or sometimes it's a, it's a chosen playlist or somebody builds a playlist and it's, it, it's almost a crucial component to the psychedelic experience. Um, to kind of allow for the brain to uh, wander off into different spaces without kind of focusing too much on, on the space around them. Um, and other art therapies, um, I can't think. <laughs> I can't think of any other art therapies right now, but absolutely psychedelics and art therapy go hand in hand and there's tons of research that's going on with it. And ketamine art therapy is a thing that people are doing. Um, and I've experienced myself. It's been, it was a really enjoyable and fun experience. And again, ketamine assisted therapy is a legal um, clinical, um, it is a legal a clinical intervention um, that you can find in the US right now. There are clinics that offer ketamine assisted therapy. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so uh, there's a couple, couple of questions. Um, so one, one thing that uh, I think question you may, a sort of big picture question you may appreciate, um, how can you, how can we tackle inequities that may be occurring around this research topic or practice? Um, and what are some of the important questions in your opinion that we need to keep in mind on a systemic level around these, um, treatments? What an outstanding question. Thank you so much for addressing that. And I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't address it because um, in the work that I'm currently doing is a lot on addressing um, equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigenous reciprocity um, in the use of psychedelics in the biomedical space. Um, there's a lot of research that is currently being done on uh, the ways in which black and brown and indigenous people are not being included in clinical trials. And so for that reason, um, it's really difficult to take this research that's happening primarily with uh, white folks and saying it will work for all the PTSD. Um, there's, there are, there is serious racial trauma um, that induces PTSD. And it's really important that we start to do research on the ways in which um, MDMA can help alleviate um, racial trauma-induced PTSD, for example. Um, yeah, in intergenerational trauma is a, is a great example as well. Thank you. And um, 
And there's a, a researcher named um, Monica Williams, Dr. Monica Williams, who has been doing a lot of really great work addressing um, BIPOC integration into clinical trials. Um, uh, there's, there's so much inequity that is happening within the space of psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, constantly, you know, people who are not uh, respecting where these medicines come from and the indigenous heritage and lineage that they come from. Um, there's uh, also, however, a lot of uh, trainings that are coming out that are training specifically BIPOC folks um, so that um, uh, people, Black and Brown and Indigenous people who are looking for, or, or Asian-oriented people um, who are looking for a therapist um, with psychedelics don't have to only go to somebody who is white presenting um, or who is of white lineage. Um, and they can actually find a therapist that is closer to their own culture and their own cultural norms and understandings of healing. And that has been a huge movement in uh, a, a shift that is happening in the psychedelic movement. Um, albeit, you know, mistakes have been made. And I think that um, the movement is learning from the mistakes um, in terms of um, BIPOC inclusion and equity and diversity. Um, I think, uh, so actually great follow-up to, to that question because we um, have someone uh, in, in the chat who just said, I'm a black woman who would love to be trained. Um, and we had the question earlier about um, how can therapists more generally get involved in um, using psychedelics uh, for, for patients or for mm -hmm. um, people they're working with. Yes, there are tons of trainings out there. Um, and I would be happy, you know, um, Clara, if you want to uh, connect people to me um, through email, I'd be happy to answer more of these questions if need be. Um, and I can um, potentially even make a list of all of the trainings that are out there, but just kind of briefly, I'll just mention um, there is um, Being True to You, which is a, a, a training program that is good for coaches and people who are actually not licensed therapists um, and who don't have masters in social work um, and who they want to learn how to coach uh, psychedelics. Um, there's also um, a new training program in Oregon called the ALMA Institute. And I think those would be specifically for Oregon people, um, but they are uh, very much focused on BIPOC inclusion. Um, MAPS has also done a specifically BIPOC training for MDMA therapists. Um, there's also the California Institute for Integral Studies, um, which is CIIS, and they do a whole bunch of trainings. That one is very expensive. Um, there's also um, Psychedelics Today offer like kind of an introduction to training um, therapists. Uh, fluence training um, is a great one as well. Um, there's so many. <laughs> there's, there's really a lot of training organizations right now that are coming through um, and you can literally just search up psychedelic therapy training and you'll find a whole bunch of them. Absolutely. Um, and for folks, I know a couple of people had asked about saving the chat. Um, if you click the uh, three dots right next to the, just next to and above the box where you type into the chat, um, there should be an option to save chat. So you can do that at any point if you'd like to save the chat. We'll be um, saving it as well, and we'll try to include resources that were mentioned. Um, and we definitely, uh, Jessica, we can um, kind of work together to put together a list of some of these trainings um, uh, to, to send out to folks, because um, it seemed like there was definitely interest. So we can include that in the follow-up email as well. Um, great. Um, okay. Uh, so we, we are, we're almost, um, we're almost wrapped up. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, but I do want to, um, somebody had asked, uh, about the, the, the last question I think we will, we will need to close with, um, cause I know this is uh, an area of, of expertise for, for you, Jessica. Um, 
someone asked, I am curious about the high percentage of abstinence rates from alcohol. Um, are we talking long-term continuous abstinence or a few weeks slash months? So is this mystical experience sought by the psychedelic effect simply a shortcut to the spiritual awakening attained through working through a 12-step program? Mm. Um, great question. <laughs> really great question. And I did, um, my master's degree did focus on um, the intersection of psychedelic assisted therapy and 12 step programs. And so this one really hits home to me specifically because I've had multiple people in my life um, go through the 12 step program. And that's kind of why I started in this work in the first place. Um, the high rates that you saw up there on that screen were the 40 to 45% abstinence rates. Um, again, so this was from the 1940s or 1950s. And um, the ways in which that they conducted research in the 1950s is very different than how we're doing research now. Um, I think that they weren't always, you know, reporting on the negative outcomes. It wasn't always as uh, standard um, and consistent um, as we would like clinical trials to be today. Um, and I believe that the 40 to 45% per, um, number came from a 12 month follow-up um, or 14 month follow-up study. Um, in terms of uh, the shortcut for mystical experiences, absolutely, we can call them a shortcut if um, that makes more sense for people. In a way, you know, a lot of people have said that they can attain altered states of consciousness and mystical experiences through meditation and through fasting. And taking a psychedelic is, is I would, I prefer to use the word a tool um, in our ability to attain these altered states of consciousness, um, just as uh, breath work and yoga and meditation are all tools. Um, and But I've certainly heard the argument calling it a shortcut. Um, and I mean, yeah, one thing that it's important is, is valuable to know is that the creator of the 12 step program named Bill Wilson um, was uh, in engaging with LSD um, with, uh, I believe it was at Abram Hoffer or Humphrey Osmond, the researchers who did the um, alcoholism studies in the 1950s. And, and he really wanted to include um, LSD into the 12 step program. Um, but at the time it was already included into the church um, or adopted by the church and the church did not want to allow that. So there are some books and some research done and uh, talking about Bill Wilson's experiences with LSD and how he thought that could be used with, um, um, with alcoholism or various other addictions. Um, but you know, that, that's always a really tricky line because um, with abstinence-based models like Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 Steps, you know, I'd, I never want to um, entice anybody to try a substance that they've been abstinent from uh, because there are risks that it could lead to, you know, um, a, a new perceived sense of a, a new relationship with substances. And I never want to encourage people to take that risk. Absolutely. Um, so we are, we are unfortunately, um, at, at time, we're a little over time. I know we, um, we started a little bit late due to, um, our, our technical issue. Um, but I, I do want to be respectful of folks' time and, and close us out. Um, thank you, uh, so much everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Jessica, uh, for this presentation, um, as I said, we will be sending um, a the, the link to the to the recording as well as um, the slides that were used to um, everyone who registered. So you are welcome to um, look at that. And um, we we just so much appreciate everyone being here for your all your questions and input. Um, and and the back and forth in the chat was great to see. Um, and yeah, um, I hope everybody has a really safe, um, Can rest of their evening. Thing? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see here, uh, somebody, um, uh, made a really important suggestion about addressing, um, allegations of sexual abuse and harm in both the underground and in clinical settings. And I appreciate you so much for bringing this up. This is absolutely so crucial. And, um, I, I 
apologize for not bringing this up. This is important to address. Um, the regulation of psychedelic assisted therapy right now is not very clearly set up. The accountability that is um, needed um, and the ramifications that should be involved are not fully set up yet. This is a, an emerging um, uh, modality to therapy, and there have absolutely been allegations, not only allegations, but actual um, true experiences of people being sexually assaulted through psychedelic assisted therapy. And it's really important that that research is done. And in choosing a place to conduct or to go do psychedelic assisted therapy, or even an ayahuasca or ibogaine ceremony or ritual, please be uh, careful in um, reading thoroughly about these, um, these retreat centers because there are a lot of people who are out there taking this opportunity to make money. Um, and there are actually, I would love to potentially um, add on to the resource list, like ways to choose a good ayahuasca ceremony, ways to choose a good ibogaine clinic um, and things like that. And I think, thank you so much to the person in the comments who addressed that. It's an absolutely important thing to bring up in the introduction of psychedelic assisted therapy. Absolutely. Um, and, and we do, uh, we do intend to um, hold some additional uh, events on this topic. It's gotten a lot of press and a lot of um, discussion and we want to be a part of that conversation. So that's definitely something that we'll be um, being uh, considering and, and taking into account as much as possible um, for, for future events. So appreciate the suggestion and the, the um, information. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Jessica, did you want to say anything else to close us out? Um, perfect. Just, um, yeah, do your research. Um, there's a lot of information out there. And um, this is just the beginning for, I think, a lot of people out there. And there's so many uh, Psychedelics 101 that you could take through Double Blind Magazine, Psychedelics Today. And there's, there's just so much. So just be careful out there and uh, do it safely um, and think about set and setting and proper integration and a lot on Reddit. And also, um, um, ooh, I'm forgetting a, a really valuable uh, resource, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put it in, in a list somewhere um, for a bunch of, um, you know, people's experiences with different substances. Oh, Arrowhead. Here, I'll write it right here. Arrowhead. That's a really good resource as well. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, thank you so much. Have a great, have a great evening. Thank you. I'll Thank stay you, on. Jessica. Yeah.